Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about perhaps one of the simplest and most intuitive algorithms known as the K-nearest neighbors. K-nearest neighbors algorithm is not just used for making predictions, but it also helps us solve multiple problems with the data relative to missing values as well as data imbalance. If these terms are not familiar to you, you'll get to know about them in the subsequent videos. But for now, let's just focus on K-nearest neighbors from the predictive capabilities perspective. So let's say we have a data like this. You can imagine we have two classes here. We have a class which is red and another class which is blue. Let's say you're trying to draw a line so that you can segregate these points from each other. So you're trying to find a line which on one side would have all the blues and on the other side would have all the reds. Is there a line like that that we can draw? Let's give it a try. So if I draw this line, I'm able to do some segregation, but this is not very accurate. Why? Because we are trying to conclude that the points to the right of this line are all blues and the points to the left of this line are all reds. But that's not the case. Why? Because we have these many points which will be misclassified. We concluded that this direction is supposed to be blue, but we have some red points here. Similarly, we concluded that this direction is supposed to be red, but we have some blue points here. So in this case, these points which are highlighted basically represent misclassification. If your data is not linearly separable, a line would not do a job. In such cases, we may resort to something more interesting, such as k-nearest neighbors. So how does a k-nearest neighbor work? Let's understand this with the help of an example. Let's consider that we want to identify if we are given a point here, which color should it belong to? Let's say first point is this, second point is this, and third point is this. So we want to identify which color should be assigned to these three points. Let's look at these one by one. So for the first point, if we draw a circle around it, basically just to find certain number of observations which are close to it. Let's say we draw the circle. So what is it that we see dominates here? If you look at this circle, within this, we have six points. If that is the number of neighbors that we consider, so nearest observations will be called neighbors, then we have a clear dominance of these red points. So we may say that we would like to classify this point as a red point because it has a clear dominance of red. By the way, generally we look for the number of points as an odd number because you can imagine if we go for an even number, there could also be a tie. For example, if there was one more blue point, you will say there are three reds and three blues. So how do we break the tie? So that could be confusing. So generally as a practice, we refer to odd number of points as neighbors. That's something which we are allowed to pass as a model hyperparameter. Now let's shift our focus to the second point and we will go to this point first and then we'll come to this one. So let's go to this point here and let's try to understand how would this be classified. So in this point, we see that there is a dominance of blue neighbors. For example, we considering only five nearest neighbors and we have four blues and just one red. So obviously, this is more likely to be a blue point. See, this is how simple the logic is. You just define the number of neighbors, the nearest points that you're looking at, and within the decided number of points, just do a multi-voting. Whichever category you win is the class assigned to this unknown point. Now let's move to this point. And why I chose this later is because the first point was more to the left, which was dominated by reds in any case. The second point here was more to the right, which was dominated by the blues. This point, however, is somewhere in between. So how does k-nearest neighbor tackle this? Well, for this, again, there is not much of a difference. The logic is same. You draw a circle. You look for five nearest neighbors and do a multi-voting. In this case, the dominance of reds is visible. We have five neighbors. Three of them are red. So this should ideally be assigned the color red. So in summary, this is how the k-nearest neighbors algorithm works. Notice while this is very intuitive to understand, there could be a small complexity involved with respect to its execution. For example, in order to find out the five nearest neighbors, you're going to compare the distance of each point with every single point that's available. And that could make the algorithm computationally very expensive. So to crack that, k-nearest neighbors is generally assisted by some of these search algorithms like KD tree, which is a K-dimensional tree, and ball tree. You can imagine that is like a small region around the point only is considered for calculating the nearest neighbors. Otherwise, K-nearest neighbors would become very computationally expensive. And these options like KD tree and ball tree are usually provided to you with the app. You may go with the default or you may choose to change as per your requirement. Generally, KD tree works with smaller data sets and ball tree would work really well with large data sets. 
But again, that's a relative reference. You may experiment with these and find out what works best for your data. Another interesting aspect is, let's say we have outliers in the data. So you can imagine in the decision-making process, these bad guys would not have any influence here. Why? Because let's say you're looking for a particular point here, you're going to look at only the nearest neighbors. Outliers would not affect the decision of the algorithm. So far, we've used K nearest neighbors to solve a classification kind of problem. So we said we'll do a voting in the local neighborhood and decide whichever class dominates is the label that will be assigned to the unknown observation X. But can we use K nearest neighbors also to solve regression kind of problems? Which means we may not be concerned about the class in that case. We are interested in predicting a value. So the answer is yes. We can use K nearest neighbors also to solve regression kind of problems where your answer is a value. And how does it work? Pretty similar. So imagine in this view, we do not have any segregation in terms of reds and blues like classes. All we know that these are some data points in our space. Now using the same logic of local neighborhood, you can find out an average of the neighbors. So let's say if you've chosen the number of neighbors as five, you can take an average of the five nearest neighbors and find out the value of X. So here in this case, it will be an average of these five values. In this case, it will be an average of these five values. And once again, here you can choose the five nearest observations and take its value. Notice five again is just a reference. You might take a greater or a smaller number depending on your choice. It's a hyperparameter, which is controlled by the person conducting the experiment. So once again, K nearest neighbors can solve both classification and regression type problems. So in a previous example, we looked at the number of neighbors as five, and that was done for illustration purposes. Let's see what's the effect of the choice of the number of neighbors here. So we are starting with a scenario where let's say we have just one neighbor. So when you have just one neighbor, look at the decision boundary, right? What does this image represent? We have these classes like reds and blues, and we've just kind of given them the appropriate region. If a point falls here to the left in this light shade of red, it is likely to be a red color class. And if a point falls here to the blue shade, it's likely to be a blue class. And right now, if you see, you have a perfect separation. You do not have any misclassification. All the blues have been covered accordingly in the appropriate class, and all the reds have been covered appropriately in their appropriate classes. But what if we increase the number of neighbors and just observe the changes in the decision boundary? So let's say if I increase the number of neighbors from one to three, did we observe a change? Now the decision boundary has been revisited. Now do you see that there is some misclassification that's happening here? For example, this point red here seems to be misclassified because as per the model, this region would be dominated by the blue class. And similarly here, this point is also being misclassified. I, once again, I've just rolled it back to k is equal to one. You can see there is no such error. But when I increase it to three, you could see that this point is being misclassified and this point is being misclassified like this, as you can see here. Now, if we further increase this, let's say I take this to a value of five, then what happens? So the decision boundary further got a little more relaxed and you have a chance of more misclassifications happening. Let's say we increase this to a bigger number. Let's say we take it to nine. Nine neighbors is what we are considering. Now you can see there are more misclassifications. There, these two red points are being misclassified by the model. This blue point is still being misclassified. If we increase this further, let's say we take it to 13, then what happens? Yeah, so it's kind of changing. So of course, depending on the location of the points, you would see some more misclassifications being added now. As you can see, this is a new misclassification. And this again is a new misclassification. I'll just roll it back to nine again and see, try to observe. See, while we were looking at nine, this was not a misclassification. This was a borderline case. But when we change it to 13, now both the points are confirmed misclassifications. So while you might be thinking that increasing the number of neighbors is something that's increasing the errors, this is where we actually have to do a trade-off. So neither the number of neighbors as a very small number like one is a good choice, nor it as a high number is a good choice. That's why we call it a hyperparameter. So when we learn the hands-on aspect of this algorithm, we will learn to choose the right value of K. We have to do a trade-off because a high, extremely high value could cause a lot of classification error extremely low value could cause another problem that's known as the overfitting. You're too rigid in terms of classifying as you see the records. So when you receive any general data, you're not able to do classification. Let's now discuss the assumptions relative to k-nearest neighbors. Since this is a distance-based algorithm, why? Because we are calculating the distance of the nearest neighbors from a given point. How do you decide something is nearest neighbor? 
based on the distance. So if you're dealing with a data set which has variables on different scales, you first need to bring them to the same scale. That's a part of data preparation. It is sensitive to scaling. Once that's taken care of, you're somewhat sorted. The second statement related to assumptions that I make is not so common, but I want to still make that statement. We should still check for multicollinearity. If you're watching this video up to this stage, I would appreciate if you could comment and let us know why should we check for multicollinearity in case of K nearest neighbors. A lot of places, a lot of books don't talk about it, but I emphasize on that too. Well, that brings us to an end of this interesting video. Hope you had something new to learn.